Thanks, Ben. That last request that you would speak to us, Lord, in a new way, that's our, our goal. As we look at Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 3, in a moment I'm going to have Stephen Schwab come up and read that to us. Before I do, I want to start it with two words. Two words that you probably and I wouldn't probably necessarily relate to this passage, but the, one, the first word is pleasure, and the second word is journey. I want to look at two verses to, to sort of springboard us to Genesis 1. The first one comes from Psalm chapter 16, verse 11. It should be up there on the screen. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. When you think of God, do you think of pleasure, an eternal pleasure? And that's what this is pointing to. I'm going to try to make a case from Genesis chapter 1 that that's what the whole creation account is, is pointing to. And the second word is the word journey. Hebrews 11.3 says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. As we think about creation and the creation account, and we often hear the debate about, well, how did God create, which distracts us from what the people of faith are called to, which is a journey toward a promised land. The first two names that show up after the creation account, or two, two names in the, I'm sorry, in Hebrews, in Hebrews on this account of faith, the two first names that appear there are Abel, who with his love for God ends up dying at the hands of his brother, and Enoch, who walked so closely with God, ended up being transported to heaven, it seemed, without death. In Hebrews 11, it says, anyone who wants to come to God must believe that he exists and rewards those who diligently seek him. So this morning, uh, as we look at these, at, at Genesis, here's the big idea. And with that, I'm going to invite Stephen up. The big idea is this. God's design welcomes treasured people into his pleasure. So we're going to talk about God's design. But all of Genesis is an invitation to the people of God. The first hearers that were to hear this would be the people just got out of slavery after 400 years. And God is saying, listen, I'm going to take you to a promised land. A, plan, a place of shalom, peace, and prosperity. A place of pleasure. So this journey towards pleasure. God, and God's design is inviting his treasured people, welcoming them into his eternal pleasure. I'm going to invite Stephen up. Stephen, if you come and read to us Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1, verses 1 through chapter 2, verse 3. If you have your Bible, I urge you to follow along. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was, with, with, was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, the second day. And God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. God called the dry land earth. And the waters that were gathered together he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit, bear, fruit trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed according to their own kinds, and trees bearing fruit in which is their seed, each according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the third day. 
And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light upon the earth. And it was so. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. And God set them in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth, to rule over the day and over the night and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the heavens. So God created the great sea, creatures and every living creature that moves with which the waters swarm according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. And God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the sea and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Stephen. So, we've just heard the account, and here we're proposing that God's design welcomes us, his treasured people, into his pleasure. So let's take a look at this and kind of unpack it as we look at this. Uh, because in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it says, and it says that this Holy Spirit intentionally was, was gonna bring clarity out of chaos. One of the first verses there says the spirit was brooding over basically what could be defined as chaos. As Andrew said last week, and if you did not listen to Andrew's, uh, Andrew Sheard's uh, sermon from last week, he was setting the stage for our look at Genesis. We're gonna look at it a little differently. Um, I really urge you to do that. But he pointed out that the people who first read and heard Genesis were the people who had freshly been rescued from Egypt. And as they were coming out of Egypt, remember, they'd been there for 400 years, which is about the age of our country when it comes to the establishment of the Europeans coming here. So for 400 years, they've been indoctrinated with Egyptian mythology. And even though they had this story of Abraham's promise, they had no written word. And so it's very likely that they were indoctrinated and they, they fell into, just like you and I have fallen prey to some of the indoctrination of modernity or post-modernity, we become influenced by the thought around us. And so what we find here, and I'm going to uh, suggest a, a book that Andrew mentioned last week, and we'll have it in this week's weekly update when it comes out, written by two guys out of Dallas Seminary who are just godly scholars, but they present a thought that I think is really, really helpful that when, 
we look at the creation account, Moses is responding to the e Egyptians' belief of creation. And if you actually line them up, they're very similar. You, some of you know the old uh, first, uh, the Great Awakening hymn writer by the name of Charles Wesley. He wrote over 6,500 hymns back in the 1700s. And he was notorious for taking a pub tune, a, a tune that was sung down at the local uh, dive, that they would be pounding out on organs, which I, well, I don't know if the organs were invented in the 1700s or not, but anyway, they, he, would take, he was notorious for taking the pub tunes and, and taking the tunes and set, setting godly theology to those tunes. I think that's a really good way to look at Genesis creation account. That the Egyptians had been singing this bad tune of creation and God inspires Moses to take that tune and set to, uh, set to that music the real story of why God created. God is taking, I think, according, ooh, I'm sorry, I leaned down. According to um, this thought that um, these writers, Miller and Soden, the book is named In the Beginning, We Misunderstood. And it really deals with how we've gotten trapped in how God created rather than why God created. We all know he created. By faith, we believe that. We started that with Hebrews. But, but modernity has been so, we worship science so much. We're more, we get far more trapped into how God created, whether you believe it's six literal days or that's just rather than why God created. And I'm going to propose this morning that God created a designed world to welcome us into his eternal pleasure, welcome us as treasured children. So we're going to look at this morning a place of pleasure, a people of pleasure, and the presence of pleasure. Let's start with a place of pleasure. This is the creation account. Uh, basically verses 3 through 25, we get the first five and a half days and God lays out a place where he wants his immense delight and joy to be um, just it, it relished by his creatures. And so as we look at day one, and what I want to do is take these five days and kind of lay out some pictures of how I think this can look to us as why God created things the way he did, how he lays things out the way he does for our understanding towards pleasure in him. Now, let me side note. We are fallen sinful people who often seek pleasure apart from God, which there's, there's a little pleasure in sin for a season, for a short time. So that, that's, what, that's what the world runs after, pleasure uh, apart from God. And, and, and the Bible's presenting, no, God wants you to find pleasure through God. By the way, there are others who say, no, God doesn't want you to be happy at all. He just wants you to be holy. And I would argue, no, holiness means full devotion, means full happiness or joy in God. Anyway, a place of pleasure. Let's take a look at day one. Day one is this. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness and God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was an evening and there was a morning the first day. Now this term good gets used multiple times. It means it's pleasurable. Light throughout the Bible is symbolic of God showing us his truth. It's kind of like a dramatic presentation. Like if, in, if you've ever been in a theat uh, theatric presentation, lights, camera, action. The lights have to come on first. Oh, sorry about that. Me and my, uh... okay, sorry about that. Sound like God. <laughs> or you've, you've heard the term when someone opens a new business, lights are on and we're open for business. Well, here I think is what God is saying. He's creating and he's saying, I created light so you can see the truth of who I am. And so the first day is this like, okay, I'm open for business, lights, camera, action. Here comes a display of my goodness. And I want you to see that my goodness in all of its glory is about an invitation to you enjoy who I am as God and living with me forever. And so the lights are on. And what he's saying is this is going to be a good place. 
The second day, we see here, this, uh, this, there's a, it says there, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the water and let there separate the water from the uh, waters from waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under and the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse. And it was so, and God called the expanse heaven. And there was heaven, uh, there was evening and the morning and the second day. Interesting on day two, you know what is left out of here? The word good. Does that mean it's a bad day? No, and it's kind of, a, kind of a confusing thing, like water and expanse, what's going on there? Um, at, at the end of the day, I think what we're looking at here is God saying, listen, I don't want you just to know my goodness. I want you to see the grand and lavish nature of God's greatness on display. And so he's dividing out and he's separating and he's saying, and, and, and taking the emphasis just off his goodness, he's saying, I am causing every, everything to have a place. I want you to see my greatness on display as well. And so this good place is a place of God's greatness. That all of that we see is, is not just about his goodness, but about his greatness. And his immensity. There's, there's, as scientists have discovered, they can't find the edge of the universe. Can't find an end to it. And then as scientists look not just out into the universe, but down into the, 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 the uh, subatomic, sub -ab 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 yeah, can I say it, um, structure, there's no end there either. Like they just keep, like each way it goes is eternal. And I think on day two, God is saying, listen, my goodness is immense with no measurement. You can't measure it. Day three, he brings about plants. And God said, let the waters under the earth be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so, and God called the land earth and the waters were gathered together called seas. And God was, saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit, bearing fruit in which there was seed, each according to its kind on the earth. And it was so, and the earth brought forth vegetation, plants, plants yielding seed according to their own kind, the trees bearing fruit in which it, uh, in which it uh, is their seed according to its own kind. And God saw that was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. What's going on there? We've gone from a transition of God forming sort of the, the limits of the universe and, and you know, light and darkness and the expanse and separating the waters and, and the non-waters. And he's gone from from uh, forming to filling, and he starts with plants. One of the big arguments people have against like creation order, like this is, God did not put out a, 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 a creation story to satisfy uh, a scientist's mind. That was not his goal. And one of the arguments is that, how could he have plants without the sun? The sun doesn't show up the next, next day. And by the way, how can you have a morning and evening without the sun? Because the morning and evening established the day. I don't, that to me is irrelevant. What he's saying here is, I'm going to fill the earth with lush life. I'm going to fill it in such a way it flourishes. My wife has this orchid that we've had, it was my mom's. And it has bloomed and it has four blossoms on it. And they have stuck with us for month after month after month. First in the apartment we're in and now in our house. And, and uh, I, I look at those four blooms on those four flowers on the orchid. And they're so intricate, amazing. And to think that there are orchids that, that flourish and bloom without anybody seeing them but God. This idea that, we are, that God is good and he puts us in a flourishing, that word flourishing, this idea that of lush. Uh, have you ever been to Longwood Gardens down in, is it Pennsylvania, New Jersey? Pennsylvania. You walk through gardens where there's plants of all sorts of all kinds. And this is a God who says, I'm filling the earth to flourish it, to cause it to be a place of, of life. Day four. Now here we get the heavenly bodies and I'm not going to read all of this. I'm just going to read a part of it. Verse 16, and God made the two great lights, the great light to rule the day and the lesser light to, uh, to rule the night. And then he throws in three words. 
and the stars. I forget how, I, 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 I saw the number as I was reading this, how many billions of stars are just in our galaxy. And there are billions of galaxies. God says, listen, I made them. That's all he says is, I made the stars. It's, it was like no big sweat for me. What is this saying? I, I think there's this idea that God is creating a world filled with so much of his, his creative power and so much diversity. The stars with all their different orbits and, 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 and uh, galaxies. He's saying, listen, I am, I am, this is, this is my doing. And I got the sun to rule the day and the moon to move, rule the night. And that's just part of my diverse creation. And I want you to enjoy what I do at day and what I do at night. I want you to enjoy the diversity of my goodness. I'm throwing out some words here as we rattle through these days because God is a God of lavish diversity. And he keeps saying, this is a good place. This is a place filled with pleasure. Then we get to day five. And he fills the waters and the sky. And I'm not going to read this because Stephen already read it. But all the waters are filled with all sorts of fish. One of my hobbies all my life has been having fish. Aquariums or a backyard pond with goldfish. I'm just amazed by fish. I can look at fish. And you know, the diversity in fish are just incredible. And then there's the birds. The birds of all sorts of colors and, and uniqueness. And God tells them to fill the earth, multiply and fill the earth. And as you think of birds and fish and, and swarms of, of uh, or uh, schools of fish and, and uh, flocks of birds, you just kind of think of this energy of life of, of birds filling the, the world with, with, with God's incredible goodness on steroids. Pumped up like Lots of it. And then we get to day six. Halfway through the day, we get all the animals. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kind, livestock and, stock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kind. And it was so. And God made the beasts of the earth according to their kind and livestock according to their kind and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God is making a good place and it's filled with all sorts of pleasure. It's, it's, he's turned the lights on so we can see it. It's visible. It's immense. It's diverse. It's lush. It's energetic and it's abundant. We see these animals just God saying, hey, fill the earth. Make lots of your kind. This is a good place. I want you to see it. I want you to laugh at some of the funny things I've made. Walking through the earth for the first people made in the image of God were people to be overwhelmed by the pleasure of God. They were hugging all sorts of weird animals because there was no, it was like being at the zoo. Yeah, I've been to the zoo, I've been to the zoo in a while. But like, there's some really cool creatures there, but they're all caged up to keep them from you and you from them, but not in God's intended created order. This leaves us with this thought. God made a place of pleasure. It is meant to be seen by the light. It is, meant, it is immense. It can't be measured. It is filled with lush and diverse life that's energetic and abundance. This is a place of pleasure. And he's inviting his people into that because he's going to make it all new again. Now this leads, it leads us, this is a place of pleasure. This leads us to the second thought, the people of pleasure. The Adam and Eve account, which we'll deal with more next week and, and uh, talk, we'll take a little detour and talk about marriage in this as well. But at this point, he says, let us make man in our image. Unlike any other creature, he says, let us make people we can relate with. And let them have dominion over the fish so they have, they not just like God, but now they have dominion. Uh, dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Complete equality with, with females and males. Everything God made for his sharing his pleasure, not just with a place, 
but with people. You were made for God to share his pleasure with you. God blessed them. And think about that. The words out of Genesis, God blessed people. By the way, interesting note. You don't see this in the English so much, but day one through five, it reads this way in the Hebrew. One day, a second day, a third day. But you get to the sixth day and it says, the, the, the definite articles dropped in. If you know anything about English, that means something specific. The sixth day. Even in the language, God is pointing us towards something more than just a place of beauty. He's calling a people to himself to enjoy all that he has. And he makes us like God. We are like God. We have the attributes of God. The big difference between you and God is that you have limits on your attributes. Like, is God creative? Yes. Are you creative? Yeah. I was packing up my office this week and uh, moving it over to our house. And um, of course, I've collected there for 20 years all sorts of things. And one of them was a, a uh, handmade um, container that my son Jed, who's probably our most creative child, I don't want to compete with your twin brother or your other siblings, Jed, but He's clearly got a lot of creativity, his artwork and all that, and, and he's, he's just super creative. But nothing that Jed has made is, is, is equal to who he is. And yet God makes people like himself with creative powers, limited, unlike God who's unlimited. He's given us knowledge, limited. God's is un, unlimited. He's given us power, strength, limited. His is unlimited. And then there's the moral attributes. He's given us love, but the average person can only average love about 120 people. That's how many people you can really get to know and, and love well. God has no limits to his love. And then he speaks. God not, not, not just makes us like himself. In fact, I think it was the theologian Bavink says, human nature in its origin design original design is full of wonderful, powerful, godlike potential because that's the way we were made to be micro divine beings. We're not divine. We're micro divine. We're, we're like God. And then God speaks his words like, and he said, let there be light. So his words are powerful. They get stuff done. They form things and then they fill things. If you look at the, the days of creation, you got the forming and the filling. He, he talks to uh, his treasured people and he tells them about what they are to do. Be fruitful and multiply. Have fun and fill the earth. Subdue it. Bring it unto your reign. He talks to himself. God says, let us make man. We're invited into what God's doing because he shares with us his word. This idea that we're people made for the pleasure of God is included in this fact that God is telling us what he's doing. And he empowers us. He gives us the power to Edenize. That's a word that <laughs> I think uh, we're collaborating. One of the guys, uh, sermon collaborating, says he's, he's called us to Edenize, make all the earth like Eden. God drops Adam and Eve and Eden said, this is my garden. What do you think of it? Pretty nice. Go and Edenize the whole world. Bring it under your control. Wouldn't it be great to have the power to, to shape things the way you want without sin, without selfishness, to share it with everybody? That's, that's the idea here. And so God has designed his treasured people to invite into his eternal pleasure. He has a place, his creation. He has a people. And those sin, and we're not going to talk about that much right now, but though sin has brought the curse and everything we experience is got a, a, it's tainted. Jesus says he's coming back and making all things new. He's going to make the world new. We, he's going to reestablish things without sin so that his people, his treasured people can live in his pleasure forever. This leads us to the presence of pleasure. In chapter two, verses one through three, God invites us to join him 
He's not saying, hey, there's my pleasure. Go out there and enjoy it. He's inviting us to him to enjoy what he's made in his presence. Remember that verse we started out, the very first verse we put on the screen this morning. Hebrews chapter, no, it wasn't Hebrews chapter. It was, uh, Psalms chapter 16, verse 11. In his presence there is fullness of joy, and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. What sin does is think, I can find pleasure apart from God. This, this falls, so here's a practical way. We often go on vacation and check out on God. We leave him behind. When, and we come back exhausted and further in debt, and rather than saying, God, I am running to you to enjoy what you have made in the national parks. I'm going to enjoy resting in your abundance. I'm going to sit by your seashore and be refreshed by your breeze and, and, and sipping that non-alcoholic drink. <laughs> no, I don't know. Sick is sipping whatever brings you pleasure because it's a gift from God. Receiving all things as a gift from God. And this is what we find on day seven. Thus the heavens and earth were finished and all the hosts of them. And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done and he rested on the seventh day and from all that he, his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it, God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. By the way, you know what's interesting about day seven in this account? All the others had um, the morning and the evening were the first day. Not on the seventh day. There's no description. Why? Because it's alluding to the fact this, the rest in God's presence is eternal. In fact, in Hebrews, we're invited, we're told there's a rest for the people of God. Hebrews chapter four, verses nine through 11. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his work, works as God did for, from him. Let us therefore strive to enter the re that rest. God's design for in the beginning, God, he's saying, I'm going to make a good place. I'm going to make people. And I'm going to invite them into my presence. I'm going to invite them into my presence of pleasure and joy. Remember, in his presence is fullness of joy, and at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And we know this to be the case because the story begins with God putting Adam and Eve in that perfect place. And we know that he, he gave them a task to do and said, enjoy. And then he would show up in the cool of the evening and uh, you read the, the account after sin entered, they didn't want to be in God's presence because they were ashamed. We get to the end of the Bible in, in Revelation chapter 21 and 22, and it says, God will dwell with his people. God is inviting you to relax in his presence. You don't need to worry about your sin. Christ has paid for it. You don't need to worry about death because Christ has conquered it. You don't need to worry I mean, anxiety comes up in all of us, right? But when we practice the presence of God by giving him our concerns, when we turn it over to him, somehow in a wonderful, mysterious way, his presence lifts our spirit beyond anxiety and we experience what it means to have the pleasure of his presence. And here's an interesting final thought here. Adam and Eve, their first day on the job. Six days he created, on the sixth day he created Adam and Eve, these people of pleasure. He gave them the things to do. Their first day on the job was a holiday. It was the seventh day. I mean, if you take it literally, and some of you would take it literally, that's fine, I don't know. That's, I'm gonna recommend the book because I, I don't think that's what Genesis is promoting, but um, regardless, the first day on the job, their job was, hey, rest with God. Like, enjoy all that I am, all my all the pleasures of my immense goodness. I'm, I'm turned on the light so you can see everything. My, my lush and, and diverse world. First day on the job is a holiday. Kind of cool. Is God inviting us into an eternal rest right at the beginning of this book of his? Absolutely. He's inviting us into the pleasure of who he is. You see, God's design, and however you read the creation account, 
you want to take the scientific mind, that's fine. That's not how the, the, uh, the first readers would have read this. They would not have had a scientific mind. They're coming out of Egypt where the Egyptians had their creation account. And actually, as you look at Genesis chapter uh, one, this lines up with the Egyptian account. So Moses is discipling his people out of the bad, the bad bar tune that they're listening to and putting holy words to it that God created. And he created it for our pleasure. And the why is, is God has made us to enjoy his presence. Now here's, here's some takeaway thoughts, okay? If God's designed his people, invites them into to share his world, here are some takeaways. Number one, when you doubt the goodness of God, get out into his world, his place of pleasure. God's creation still speaks to us. This is why some people, and you know, some people say, well, I don't, I don't come to church because I feel closer to God in nature. Of course you feel cl closer to God in nature. He made it. You're in the midst of his artwork. That doesn't make it right for you to only be there. But you, you can be a pagan and enjoy the, the, the glory of God's creation. But for God's people, those who, who trust in Jesus, when you doubt God's goodness, when you get down, go take a walk. Breathe in fresh air. Stare at a bird. Two weeks ago when, when Elliot preached on Psalm 19, he, he mentioned this very thing. And I think it's a theme through the Bible. God constantly points to his creation. And, and one of the problems that modernity has is we live in boxes. We have a box house, we have a boxed office, we have a box car, and we shop in box stores. And I'm preaching to me because I, I, don't, I don't like to go out. I, I walk now, and that's my exercise, but like, I'm not the hiker. and you know, I, you know, all, all, all that outside stuff is not like normal to me because I've been brought up in like the confines of living in a in a, you know, a boxed life. When you doubt God's goodness, take a walk out in his goodness and let that speak to you of his pleasure. Be captivated by the clouds. Study the stars at night. Breathe in that crisp, frigid, sub-zero air. Let it speak to you. And even the goodness there is, it won't stay, it won't stay that way. You know, 62 days in spring, and that day it might be 62 degrees. <laughs> so do that. Number two, when you question your value, listen to God's word. Now, throughout Genesis 1, it keeps talking about God speaking. He spoke creation to existence. He spoke to Adam and Eve. He spoke to himself. The words of God mean something. When you question your value, listen to the word of God. Your eternal identity is and this is really important. So often we talk about our sins and we're going to end with communion to remind us that our sins are covered. But at the end of the day, your eternal state isn't a sinner. It's a saint. And, and you and I need to be buoyed, buoyed, yeah, lifted. We need to be like lifted by the fact that in Jesus, we've been made saints. And the things that, that drag us down, when, when you doubt your identity as a child of God, read his word and hear the gospel again and again and again. You are a saint forever invited into the Father's house, one of great pleasure. And finally, when you are overwhelmed by the weight of this world, rest in the day of God's pleasure. This has two applications. One, just a very basic rhythmic one. One of the great challenges I have coaching young pastors is pastors have a hard time resting. They're always thinking about church and ministry and people. And, you know, even on my day off this week, I took two phone calls, uh, you know, from, from a guy over in Dover, a pastor friend, and a guy in Guatemala. Like, I just have a hard time turning it off. And so, but, but that's common for all of us. God has given us a day to rest in his pleasure. I think Sunday ought to be the day to rest in his pleasure. We grew up, when, I grew up bringing our, our, our I grew up, <laughs> Raising our kids, we, we intended to make Sunday a day of fun and pleasure, always around Jesus. Rarely would we travel on Sunday. We just said, listen, this is, this is a day that is special. We want, we want the day to be filled with, with the pleasure of God and be reminded of his goodness. And this world is overwhelming. Some of you have really intense jobs. You're taxed. Some of you work with some incredibly difficult people. Some of you are dealing with incredible affliction. I urge you to rest in the day of God's pleasure. 
You and I rob ourselves of the deep pleasure by not relaxing in the pleasure and presence of the eternal one. And that includes worship. You know, most pastors, this is true of one of my heroes, Ray Ortland, we don't like to go to church. It's work because our flesh is weighed down. Will my sermon be any good? Will so-and-so show up? Will that person, I wish they wouldn't show up. You know, like there's all that stuff going on. But most pastors I know, when we leave church, we're just riding high because we have been in the presence of God's people, with God's saints, in God's body, with Christ's people. It has filled us up. Now, that's just a pastor. This idea that being in the presence of God fills our tank, you were made for that. You and I were made to find, to relax and be refreshed in the, in the pleasure of God's presence. So those are recommendations on takeaways from Genesis chapter 1. I hope those help as you and I contemplate this idea that God designed this whole place and he designed you, his treasured people, to invite you into the pleasure of his presence. Let's pray. Lord, we are, uh, at, we doubt at times how good you are. In fact, the, the, the temptation of the evil one was doubting your goodness, and we still doubt your goodness. Our trials, our struggles, our concerns give us reason and go, God, are you with us? Are you here? Do you hear my cries? Are you good? And of course, you, oh God, have never, ever left the side of your children. Lord, I pray that we would learn to enjoy all that you've made. And we'd walk in this world with a, with, a, with a sense of the wonder of who you are. We'd be refreshed by what you've made this immense, diverse, flourishing, generous world you've made. And we who are Westerners, we get to appreciate so much more than, than others. And Lord, may we walk as people, not just in a place of pleasure, but as people who are made for the pleasure of God. Lord, may we not run away from you in our pursuit of enjoyment, but, but receive all things as a gift from you knowing that the ultimate pleasure is in your presence. Lord, we head out into another week, and actually many of us are grateful for a holiday tomorrow, but Lord, the, the weight of life and, and the toil of life weighs us down. Lord, help us to, to park ourselves and be refreshed in your presence. Help us to Sabbath well. Lord, you are, your, your goodness outmeasures the immeasurable universe. And it's, and it's for us. Help us to believe that in Christ's name. Amen.